invite Ms. Liz Alejandro to come and share the scripture with us this morning. Good morning. We're going to be reading from John chapter 3, verses 3 through 15. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into the mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from it is, or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can it be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these very things. Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we've seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you with earthly things, and you do not believe. Then how will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. We're glad to be back with y'all this weekend. Um, thank you to Jesse for a great message and for Lieutenant Laura who put together the worship service with help from the whole territory uh, last week. But it's good to have our group uh, back with y'all to worship um, together. We're going to start off with a great song that we have sung a, a few times here, uh, that God so loved the world. Uh, we're going to be talking today as we start in this new series a lot about uh, God, about Jesus and what he did in sending Jesus. Um, so we invite you to stand with us and sing and shout wherever you're. the words will be on the screen as we're playing them. Uh, but we just invite you to worship and praise the Lord and have a good time giving him glory.
God so loved the world that he sent his son, Jesus, uh, to save us, not to condemn this world, but that through him we may have life. We're going to sing a song that we have uh, not sung together uh, before, so it'll be new for most of us. Uh, it's a song by Hillsong that says, Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God, oh, praise his name forevermore. And that's what we want to do, uh, come together, even if it's through the internet, to lift up Jesus' name, to praise him, and give him all the glory that he alone deserves, because he is alone worthy of our worship.
this morning we give you all glory because you alone are worthy of all of our praise and all of the glory on the earth. We're going to sing one more song uh, this morning that thinks about Jesus and his death on the cross and his resurrection and how much we have to be grateful for and thankful for, for what he has done. In fact, part of this song is a bridge that says, thank you for the cross, thank you for the cross, thank you for the cross, my friend. And for some of you that are watching this out there, Maybe you need to remember Jesus is your friend. He's not against you. He's for you. He's, Jesus came into this world not to condemn the world, but to save it, to save you. And you can call him your friend. And we can thank him for what he has done for us. Thank you. 
season has not been an easy one that we've gone through here in 2020. Um, but I do want to echo also what my wife said, uh, that we were spared. Uh, Saturday, I was watching, watching the hurricane and praying because the winds were starting to kick up a little bit. Uh, and then all of a sudden, in the middle of the day, around 1, 2 o'clock, uh, the hurricane, I broke up. 
uh, we were watching K Triple I, and then Alan was watch. Alan Holt was giving the commentary, and the Hurricane I was huge, and it broke up, and then all of a sudden it reformed as a smaller Hurricane I about 80 miles south of here. Um, so I, I consider that an answer to prayer in a miracle now for the people who experienced it. Obviously, that's not an answer to prayer for them, but uh, for Corpus, that was an answer to prayer for us, and so we are grateful that we were spared uh, this season uh, another hurricane. Well, we're going to start a new series. As Laura said, uh, we're kicking off a new series today, and it's a, a series basically on apologetics. Now, what the heck does that mean? Uh, apologetics basically is kind of explaining uh, about our faith and what that means. Uh, the, uh, why, do, why do we need to do that? Well, in this day and age when there's different competing views of, of faith and religion, and there's religions all over the place, uh, it's very important for us as Christians to know why we believe what we believe. Uh, what, makes it, what makes us so sure? In 1 Peter 3, 15, uh, Peter exhorts us, In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who, who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. You know, that's one of the things that if you watch on Facebook and people get into arguments about religion, and if you're, if you're honest and you watch the comment section, they don't get very respectful there, right? Uh, we are to make sure we're being respectful when we're having debates or discussions on faith, on religion, and particularly our own, because sometimes even within Christianity we don't always agree. But we are called to have the heart of Jesus uh, and the tone of Jesus when we're engaging in those discussions. So as we start our new series off today, we're going to start off with um, one of the largest uh, of discussion items are the probably the largest uh, reason why people disagree with Christianity. Uh, now, if you think about Jesus, he said some pretty counter countercultural stuff. Uh, I don't know how many of you thought about this, but love your enemies? That's, that's countercultural. That totally goes against the way of the world. Or to, to love, to lose your life is to gain it. Uh, again, that's counterculture. It doesn't go with the way culture goes. And the, probably the most important thing, in fact, the main reason that people disagree with Christianity and have problems with Christianity is probably the next statement that I am going to say is that um, there is only one God and one way to heaven. And what happens with that statement is that people get really offended by it because they say that's, that's very exclusionist. You're saying that that's the only way, that's exclusionary, that's, that's not very inclusive, and you know, what about other people and other faiths? And, well, I want to bring us to a passage this morning in John chapter 14. Uh, it's one verse, so uh, everybody in your homes, uh, I won't even make you go to your Bibles for this one because it's one verse. There's some other verses we're going to look at through the Bible through the rest of the day, but John chapter 14 verse 6 is the anchor text that we're going to look at today. Uh, in John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus is having a teaching moment with his disciples, and this is what he says. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Um, one of the reasons that people have issues in discussing Christianity uh, is on the concept of exclusivity. Uh, each major faith... Uh, claims to have the answers to the key life questions. But we have to point out some obvious things that there are disagreements, uh, and we have to look at the underlying beliefs and mindsets of these other faiths. Many people would say all religions are basically the same and teach the same basic stuff. Now, I would agree that a lot of the moral concepts and ethical concepts uh, do sometimes you know, go across different religions. Judaism, Christianity, Islam kind of teach some of the same things on some points about giving to the poor, being kind to your neighbor. Okay, we, we get that, right? But that does not mean that they are all the same. Uh, let me give you another example. Um, all religions are not exactly the same because Hinduism, uh, you can't say, well, Hinduism, that you, you're, there's one God or there's a plethora of God because in Hinduism, everything is God. I mean, this, this podium is God. I am God. That's a scary thought. Uh, this, this monitor is God. Like, it's totally different. So you can't say that they all are saying the same things because they're not. You know, Islam says Jesus Christ 
was a good teacher and a prophet, but that's it. That's all he was. And the Judaism, Judaism says he was a teacher, but he went the wrong way in claiming to be God. We as Christians say, no, he is the Son of God. And that's the key claim that we have to talk about this morning. Because that one key claim changes everything. Uh, one of, I'm, I'm going to give you all just a little information here. Uh, in preparing this series, I'm relying on a couple of books. Two of the main ones is Lee, Stro Lee Strobel's The Case for Christ, which, by the way, if you're a cheater like me and you don't like reading a lot, there's a movie. You can watch the movie. Uh, so uh, that's, a, that's a free one. Like, you can go on, it's on Netflix. You can download it on Pure Flix. And it may, I don't know, it may be on some other thing. It's on the iTunes store, uh, the What's the other one? What's the Android? The Android store. You can go to that and you can find it and watch it. I strongly encourage it. The other is a book by Dr. Timothy Keller, uh, who is up in New York and pastors uh, Redeemer Church in New York. And it's called uh, The Reason for God. Uh, and so I highly recommend it. If you are a nerd and you like thinking about why we believe what we believe, I strongly encourage these two books. Okay, so let me come back. Uh, our faith reminds us as Christians that Jesus is much more than just a teacher or a prophet. He is God's son. Uh, this statement by Jesus is in John 14, verse 6, and it's huge. Other religions tell you, follow me and I'll show you the truth. Jesus says, follow me, I am the truth. Other religions say, I'll show you how to live life. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Other faiths teach us to earn God's favor and how to reach out to him. But in Christianity, the Bible teaches us that God, the Father, reaches out to us. You see, all the other faiths are about trying to appease or please God or have God favor you by doing things. Whether it be in Islam that you have to go and make a trip to Mecca, you have to pray every so many uh, hours, make the trip to the, the Hajj. Uh, yes, I have done some research on these other faiths, so I know what I'm talking about. Um, but you have to make God be pleased with you. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I hate, would hate the fact of, I, what if I displease God all the time? You see, in Christianity, we know that what God did in seeing Jesus Christ here is that we don't have to earn God's favor. God showed his favor by sending his one and only son to die on the cross for us. We are already loved by God. We don't have to earn his love. He already displayed his love for us. Some, some may even say, I don't feel that God is close, though. Well, the distance uh, we feel in our relationship with God is due to his nature. God is holy. He's holy. He is perfect. He is sinless. He's the creator of the world, but he's also a loving God who gave his son for you and for me. Other religions tell us to do things to please God. Do this. If you do, then God will love you. If you do, God will be pleased. You see, they're, they're busy saying do, and Christ says done. I dealt with it on the cross. I dealt with the power of sin. It's done. Lee Strobel, in one of his books, uh, made a comparison between Judaism and Christianity and Buddhism. Uh, and I'll get to that in a minute. But I want to tell you, one of the interesting things in Dr. Kim Timothy Keller's book is he said he sat down at, at a conference. Uh, it was an academic conference with not just Christians, by the way. And so they had a Muslim imam, they had a, a Jewish leader, uh, a priest, synagogue, uh, so, and then they had a priest, him, Timothy Keller, representing Christianity. And so they sat together and they, they actually agreed on a couple of things. Now there's a lot of things, uh, like I said, that they'll agree about, okay, we've got to feed the poor, help the poor, whatever. But they agreed on some major points. And their major point that they agreed on is this. If Jesus Christ is who he says he is, then both Islam and Judaism fail to love God as God truly is. But if Jesus is not God's son, then Christians fail to love God as he truly is. And the amazing thing is all three of them agree to that statement. You see, that's why we're talking about this today is that that is how important Jesus is to the Christian faith. It is very important. So we're going to talk more about this. 
So one of the things they were talking about, Lee Strobel, in his, in his uh, discussion on Buddhism and Christianity, is he, he talked about the story of the prodigal son. Now, we all know the story of the prodigal son, especially us in Christianity, where a son basically tells his father, I wish you were dead, which, by the way, he doesn't say that per se, but that's really what he means. So he gets his inheritance. He goes and he parties, lives wildly, whatever else, and then he runs out of money. <laughs> runs out of money. His friends desert him. He doesn't have any money. He's like, oh, man, my life sucks. It was better if I could just go back and be a servant in my father's house. So I, he goes back. Now, in Buddhism... They sort of have a, another series like that too, where Buddha uh, goes and he is, uh, you know, living wildly, and he comes back to his father. But here's the key difference: with Buddha, when he comes back to his father's house, guess what happens? His father makes him work 25 years. Go and do the research. Makes him work 25 years shoveling dung, poop, animal poop, uh, for 25 years. Before he is accepted back. Whereas in the Christian story of the prodigal son. When the son starts coming home. The father doesn't wait. He goes running after him. And comes to him. In fact what does he do? Do you remember? He throws the robe on him. Gives him the ring. Throws a party. My son who once was dead is alive. That's a big difference. You see. In Christianity, we don't have to work back. When we, if we just say, God, I've sinned, I've failed, I want to be back in your life, he already loves you. You don't have to make God love you. You don't have to earn and do 25 years of hard labor or service for God to be pleased with you and to allow you to be part of his family again. He already wants you part of his family. He's already reaching out with his arms wide open. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about some other things. Some other, another objection I hear all the time is this. Christianity is only as valid as any other religion. They are all equally true in their own way. Now, I, I told Jesse, Liz, and Jeremiah, and my wife, who are sitting, standing here with, sitting with me, that your heads may hurt by the end of this sermon with a lot of the deep thinking we're going to do, but I apologize. This is really important for us to know. They say that Christianity is the only, if we say that Christianity is the only valid uh, one, the, the world is saying, the world is saying that Christianity is just like every other religion. They are all equally true in their own ways. Now, I'm going to break that down. We live in a free, pluralistic society here in America. Therefore, uh, it's not popular to claim exclusively that your faith is better than the others. Because why? Because we want to be accepting of other people. We want to be caring of other people. But the argument is a flawed argument that was just made. You see, the argument says, uh, it says doctrine is unimportant while at the same time assuming a doctrine of belief about God. Put it another way, it says each religion sees part of the spiritual truth, but never can it see the whole truth. Okay, that's basically what it's saying. Now, let me give an example. Uh, I believe it's Dr. Keller. Um, it's been a while since I've done the book. But Dr. Keller gives a, a good example. I want you to close your eyes with me and imagine something. I want you to imagine that there are four or five people, all have their eyes closed, they have a blindfold that's put on them, and they are guided to, this part, uh, to a part of an animal. And only that part that they can feel, smell, touch, whatever. And it's an elephant. Now, one person is right at the front, the face, and the trunk, and he's holding the trunk of the elephant. Um, so he feels around, he digs inside the nose. Well, that's, of course, the animal gives, the elephant gives a noise that that wasn't happy with it. Another one is down at the foot. Uh, another is at the tail, and he feels the tail. And so they begin asking questions. Well, what is this elephant like? And so the first one says, well, he's long and loud. Uh, he's kind of gooey on the inside. It's kind of weird. And then the guy at the back of the tail says, well, he's, it's really skinny, actually. Really, really skinny. And then the other guy uh, who's at the, one of the feet says, skinny? He's not skinny. This thing's big, and I can't even feel it at the top of this thing, and it's rough skin and whatever. And the point being why you can open your eyes now is this. That's saying that every, all, all of those different parts of the elephant are a, a religion, and they're all part of the same thing. But the problem is, if you claim that they're all basically saying the same thing, it means that you have a view of the whole thing. 
It, it's a doctrinal claim. It's saying, okay, no religion sees the mild truth, but if that's true, that assumes that you're saying you know the whole truth. That there's somebody who does see the whole truth. So it makes a flawed premise that we need to consider. Um, so I just want you to explain that. Now, for those who have never heard that elephant explanation, you're welcome. Uh, so they also have one about how you eat an elephant one bite at a time. But that's another, that's another story for a different sermon at another day. Okay. So, I want to go on, uh, and it, it assumes that it knows all, for that, that belief in society. Now, we live in the United States, praise God, and let me tell you, I am grateful every day that I live, that I am an American, that I, I am in the United States of America. Listen, it's not saying we've got everything right. It's not saying the United States of America is perfect. Lord knows we all know that right now, especially this year. Some of the sins and the failings of the United States over the past 200 years are being brought up, and should be. Uh, but I can tell you this, having traveled all, not all over the world, but traveled to different parts of the world, our country, when you come home and you s set your feet on American soil, there is nothing like the relief you feel when you enjoy, see how many freedoms we get to enjoy. And I have friends from all over parts of the world, Sweden, Germany, England, France, uh, you know, S South America, Mexico. I've got friends everywhere, Australia, and they also, it is amazing the freedoms that you Americans have. Now, I want to explain about America and our freedoms. The United States Constitution, which is what, by the way, what governs our country, it's actually the law of the land. Some people are like, well, the Declaration of, the Declaration of Independence was a letter to King George V to say, we are ticked off at you, here's what you've done wrong, we're rebelling, we're forming our own nation. It was a letter. The Constitution is actually what governs our country. And the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, it guarantees that every religion must be allowed to practice their religion without interference and that they will not be a state religion established. So that's where you hear always talked about the establishment clause, that the government shall not establish a religion. But also in the same sentence, the same wording is the non-interference clause, that the government shall not interfere with the religion. Now, because we, we believe that we want to practice tolerance and treat everybody equally, what that means is every religion is equal in the sight of the law. And there is, they can't be harmed. So if you want to go start your religion and, and worship Jesse, you can go start your Jesseism worship group. Now, that's if you want to do it. Jesse didn't know I was going to say this, so he's laughing. Um, but hey, if it floats your boat, go ahead. You know, Jesse's your God, whatever. Um, but you are equally protected. Now, listen, we all know that's insane. Uh, Jesse himself is laughing as he's chugging water right now, trying not to spit it up. That we, that we know that Jesse's not God. Jesse knows he's not God. But if somebody wants to believe that, guess what? Under the United States Constitution, they must have equal treatment. And that is fine. But let me express this. Just because every religion has an equal, um, equal treatment under the Constitution does not mean that they are equally true. See, truth is what we're really what we're, we're talking about today. Everything comes down to believing the credibility of your God. And in this case, everything in Christianity comes to the credibility of Jesus Christ. That's where we're at today. John 14, 6 again, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. So the question to ask ourselves is, how reliable or trustworthy is Jesus to you? What's his credibility that makes this statement ironclad. Well, here's the thing. He backs it up. You know, the, the test of whether somebody is a god, the, the test of whether somebody is a doctor, is can they perform the functions and do what they say they're going to do? I always tell to people that are prophets that are false prophets, because guess what? There are plenty of them. They love to make predictions, and I'm like, <laughs> I laugh and I say, you know the two trust of a prophet, right? The true test if you're going to be a prophet is if your prophecies come true. If your prophecies don't come true, you're not a prophet. You're a false prophet. Okay? That's a whole story for another. But the point being is you've got to have credibility. You display credibility based on what you've done, what you've earned. Now, Jesus, let me bring this up. To fulfill the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled in one lifetime, um, there, was, there were math, mathematicians who studied uh, the prophecies in the Old Testament that refer to the Messiah. For one person to have achieved five of, those, five of those prophecies was like the chance of one in 250. That one, in other words, 
one out of 250 chance that one person could achieve five of the prophecies about the Messiah in their lifetime. Now, we know that Jesus did a lot more. He fulfilled a lot more than that. You want to know the, the odds mathematically that Jesus could fulfill all the prophecies he filled while he was on earth? You want to know? It's interesting. The number is so big, I can't tell you. It is 1 divided by 10 to the 23rd power. I don't even know what that is. The 1 over 1 billion, it's bigger than a billion, zillion, trillion. Just make up. That is how big it is for all the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled about being the Messiah. That's the mathematical chance that one person could fulfill that. Now listen, the fact that he did, that tells me something as someone who relies on math a lot, that he's who he says he is. But here's the bigger thing. The real proof is in the pudding of Jesus is that he beat death. You go to all the other religions, you go to all the other faiths, and you ask them, where are they now? Buddha is dead. You can find his tomb. Muhammad is dead. You can find his tomb. Now listen, we can find the disciples' tombs where, where, their, where their earthly tombs are, where their bodies lay, which, by the way, some of it's pretty freaky. Um, I was watching TV uh, on mine on YouTube the other day and was tracing a history of what's happened to the apostles and the original starters of the church and Mary Magdalene, where she's at. And hers is weird. They have her skull publicly displayed. And I'm like, that is just freaky. I'm sorry. But the point being is, but they're not God. Jesus... They tried to kill him. You know, the Romans tried to do away with him, and that's a whole other message in itself. But the point being is, we know, because the Roman seal was on the tomb, that the, the tomb, the rock was rolled away, the seal was broken, the Roman guards were asleep, which, by the way, that was penalty of death for them to be asleep on the job. In other words, if you look at all the, the facts of the resurrection, it is beyond a shadow of a doubt that the resurrection really is true. And he appeared to so many people after he had come back from the dead that gave positive testimony that they saw him. The disciples, they put their hands in his, his hands and his side. They shared a meal with him. The 72 people saw him as he rose into heaven. They all witnessed this. So the point being is Jesus has shown that if he says something, it's true. You can bank on it. He's reliable. And the one person who's beat death is Jesus. Okay? Okay. So there's credibility there. Um, Lee Strobel was speaking at a conference a few years ago, and he told a story about what, what says uh, the stupidest thing he's ever done, which don't we love to tell stories about the stupidest thing? Jesse's laughing and Liz is laughing. Uh, my wife was saying, no, I don't like to tell stories about that. Well, Lee Strobel was telling a story about the stupidest thing he's ever done, and my wife will appreciate this one, actually. Uh, Lee Strobel, when he was a kid, he liked to paint. Uh, and so his house, they had a basement. And so to make sure he doesn't mess up the rugs, the carpet, whatever else, they would keep uh, his paints and supplies down in the basement. And he'd go down and he would paint. So Lee, was, as a kid, was painting with oil paints. He was painting with oil paints, and he, he was done. He thinks he was done with his painting, but it was going to take so blasted long for it to dry, he decided that he was going to be smart. I say that laughingly. He decided he was going to put the heat lamps closer to where the painting was and that the heat would dry the painting. Now, my wife is kind of grimacing because for those of you who don't know, oil paints melt. And that also what he did is the rags that had the turpentine, what ended up happening is the heat lamps ignited the rags and the paint. And so it kept the basement caught on fire and it got so bad that smoke filled the entire basement to where he couldn't see. And he got to the point after, you know, minutes and minutes and minutes that he was afraid that he was going to die because he couldn't find the staircase. He couldn't see anything. But then... All of a sudden, out of the smoky, smelly, dark, and heat, burst a firefighter with a large flashlight. And right there, Lee had to make a judgment. He had to make a decision. Do I trust in the credibility of the firefighter and his flashlight? Now, of course, we know the answer is like, uh, heck yeah, he did. It was, it was an easy decision. He trusts, but think about that. How do you know that a firefighter knows what he's doing? You don't know for sure. You trust, you have to trust in the process and the credentialing that he has to go through to be a firefighter. 
You see, it's the same way with us, is that we are in a state of sin that we are powerless to do anything about, and God sends His Son, Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. He also says, I'm the light of the world. And we have to choose, do we trust in His credentials as God's Son and His light that He gives to follow and get us to safety? We have to make that decision. The last sub-point that I want to discuss today under this concept is people say Christians are narrow-minded when we say that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Jesus uh, said in Matthew 7, verses 13 through 14, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Now, in the New Testament, in John, um, Jesus also says that I am the gate for the sheep. If we remember the passage. It's not on the, it's not, I'm sorry I don't have the scripture on the Bible, on the uh, internet for you guys to watch. But again, if y'all want to know, it's John chapter, excuse me, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. It's not on our projection, I apologize. But he is saying that he is the narrow gate. Okay, and that if we want to get to heaven, it is a narrow gate that very few will find compared to the whole world. Now, if you go to the book of John, John also had another series of I am statements. And one of the other ones, he says, I am the gate for the sheep. In other words, the only way that people can get into my kingdom and be part of God's kingdom is to enter through me. Now, that also meant he was the protector of the sheep that entered through him. Now, I want to come back to the passage that Liz read earlier today. So John 3, verses 13 through 16 is specifically where I'm going to look at. And so Liz is going to throw it up here in just a minute. Um, John chapter 3, verses 13 through 16 is specifically where I'm going to be at. It says, No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Verse 14, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world, this is John three sixteen. we all know this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Um, when Laura and I were in Atlanta, we um, were going in, her, it was her second year of training, and we uh, were pregnant, and we had, uh, well, she was pregnant, I was not. I look like I'm pregnant, she does not. Um, but we had Emerson. And so while we were there, um, God graced us with Emerson's birth, uh, and for those who do not know, when Emerson was born, um, he had jaundice uh, really bad. In fact, the doctor, when we, we had him born, even told us, oh, this is going to be, because we stay in the hospital a few days, and said we're going to have to do something about this. Now, those who don't know what jaundice is, jaundice is a disability of the liver. It's a disease, and what it does is it makes sure, especially if you're a white person, I'll just say it like that way, your skin gets yellowish tint. If you're not white, it does yellow your eyes. And it's a disability uh, of the liver. And so if you don't treat it, it can become very dangerous and deadly. So, of course, we wonder, well, what are we going to do? Uh, and, of course, one thing the doctors and parents tell us is get sunlight because sunlight helps. But one of the things the doctor told us is that, well, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to send you home. And what you have to do to do away with jaundice is you have to expose the body to a particular type of light, and if you do that for a period of time, it'll heal, heal your child and there'll be no problem. So we were told, take Anderson home, and you have to lay him on this light bed. It's, it almost looked like it was a, you know, y'all remember the computer scanners? I know I'm dating myself. Like the big computer scanners, Jesse and Liz are laughing. They're like really big, and like you had to lift the lid up and put them. Well, it's kind of like that without the lid. So it's like a, a, a computer picture scanner, and they put like a, like a thing with arms and legs so you could put the baby in and then you zipped him up in it. And what we had to do, Laura and I had to put him in there. It broke our hearts. Uh, the first uh, week we had with Emerson was one of the hardest weeks. We all slept on the couches outside there because we had a table, a low table, coffee table. We set the light bed and we had to, other than changing his diaper or feeding him, he had to be on that light bed. Now, when the doctor told me that this is the way to deal with it, I'll be honest with you, at first I was like, that's it? Like, don't we have to get him some drugs? Do we have to get him a shot? Do we, I mean, don't we have to get some medication from CVS or Walgreens or whatever? And the doctor's like, no, just 
do what I said. You know, put them on the light bed, three or four days, have them come back, I'll check them out, they'll be fine. You know, the reason that that's hard to swallow is because we all want to do things to make something happen. And so what I had to do, what Laura and I had to do is say, does this doctor know what they're talking about or is he cuckoo? Like, you just put our son and expose him to this light for three days and like, that's going to heal him? But when you go into a doctor's office, what's on the wall? Their degrees, their plaques, their members of the, uh, the foundations they're part of, the groups they're part of. And why they have those there is, to, is that their credibility. It's saying, you can trust me, here's why. So with me, even though I was thinking, that's kind of crazy, that's, that's all we have to do, the doctor is basically saying, trust me, I know what I'm talking about. And so what I want to say is the same thing here is, what all of our faith comes down to is the person of Jesus Christ. Is Jesus really his, really who he says he is? Only the great physician, God, offers us a treatment for the stain of sin. That's it. That's the only treatment. Jesus' fulfillment of prophecy, his working of miracles, and ultimately his resurrection from the grave display his credentials to prove that you and I can trust him when he says he is the Son of God. I always loved getting into discussions with uh, friends of mine, good, and like very good, calm, civil discussions about Jesus. And some would say, well, you know, he gave some great ethical points. And he, has, he gave us some good lessons to live by, but he's not God. And I'm like, well, here's, here's a point. Um, I don't know about y'all, but I know about with me. With me. Um, if I go and have a conversation with a guy and he says, hey, by the way, I'm God. I'm really like, uh, I'm probably not going to test and say anything else from him is bankable. But people say, oh, no, Jesus taught some great stuff. Jesus did this. He was great ethics. It's like, well, you can't say that Jesus was great on all those points and then say, because he has to either be insane or brilliant. He can't be both. You see, you can't say a guy who's claiming to be God is also one of the best teachers, theologians, teachers in the world. If he's insane, he's insane. It's the point we have to decide, is Jesus insane or is he really truly who he says he is? One of my other corners that I taught, uh, a series in Bible studies sort of like this, um, I came across a quote from Zoni, I'm trying to find it on the internet, It said this, he said, Christians are only as intolerant as Jesus is true. I'm going to repeat that. Christians are only as intolerant as Jesus is true. Now, that's saying true Christians, that we're truly living the life that Christ would have us to live. It's when we say something like this, that Jesus is the only way to heaven, and people say, well, that's being intolerant. Well, it's not being intolerant if what Jesus says is fact, if it really is true. So the question we have to ask ourselves today is, do we trust? Um, if you go around Corpus Christi, um, you drive around Corpus Christi just enough, you're going to come across something. And as much as we hate it, it's true. Construction. Everywhere. There is construction. Liz is not ahead. Jesse is too. We're laughing. It's horrible. Uh, now, praise God, they got done with Staple Street. Finally. And down where little five points is, or six points, excuse me. It's done, finally. But it was a glorified mess there for like six months. Now, out where we live, uh, they have decided now to work on Cimarron. Right at the intersection where Cimarron and Saratoga are. Now, some of you are like, whoop de doo Why? What's the big deal about this? The big deal is that we usually come out the back of our neighborhood through Cimarron and turn left on Saratoga to go to restaurants, to go get cupcakes because it was Laura's birthday the other night, uh, or whatever. Well, guess what? You can't turn left. You can't turn left from Cimarron. And I found that out last week, and it annoyed me. I had to drive all the way down Cimarron, turn right on Airline, come back up Airline, and turn right on Saratoga to go on Saratoga. See, the point being is, if, if, whether it's there at that intersection or coming downtown with all the construction, there's this famous saying and quote, and I really believe it about Corpus Christi. If you go downtown, the chances, uh, if you're trying to get on the highway, guess what? You can't get there from here. I mean, you can. They, and if you can, they say, well, you have to go this way. That's it. That's the only way to get to I-37 right now. And you're like, oh, no. Of course, it's usually our, us guys are like, no, watch this. I'll, I'm going to find another way. I'm going to find another way. Hour later, what way did he say to go? 
You see, we can debate whether there's different paths, but at the end of the day, if it is God himself who chooses who's going to be allowed to fellowship with him, he alone is going to determine the way to get to him. And so we have to come to the point here today as we close our message. Do you believe that Jesus is who he says he is? Because if you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, then you can have peace that even when others may say you're intolerant uh, because you think your God is the only God and he is the only way, but if you know for a fact and it's settled in your heart, you have no problem saying, okay, yeah, I'm a little limited-minded. Here's why I am. And when you get into the, all the discussions we've had today about facts, the prophecies, raising from the dead and the historical proof and all that other stuff, a lot of times, believe it or not, some people actually come to faith hearing those stories. But the thing I want for all of us as a church is to know, to know that we know that we know what we believe in. It's not enough just to say something and say, just because I told you as the pastor, I told you so, so believe it. No, I don't want y'all to ever do that. I want all of us to know why we believe what we believe in. And so through this series, we're going to be going through other hard questions of life. Um, and I want you to sink in and dig into each session. Now, for those of you who may have a headache after going through this first session, take some time or take some Motrin. Uh, after the message. But we're going to have my wife pray, uh, play some music. I want you to close your, your eyes, bow your heads, and I want you to think as the music plays, do you, do you trust in the credibility of Jesus Christ? That he is who he says he is. Can I tell you that, you know, I'm a very tolerant person. I'm a person who loves all people. And guess what? As Christians, and some of, some of us need to hear this, by the way, as a Christian, you should love everybody, no matter their religion, no matter their skin color, no matter what. Why? Because God made every person. Now, every person may not be following God. Every person may not be Christian. That does not matter. Every person, because they have the image of God as a human being, is due respect and kindness and love. And so we as Christians don't get out of showing kindness, love, and acceptance to someone just because they're different than us. We are still, and we are especially expected to show that because we're calling ourselves by his name. But we also need to make sure that we trust in his name. So Laura's going to play a piano song just quietly in the background, and I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes, and ask yourself, do you trust in his credibility? Do you trust that much like my story of Emerson and the doctor told us this is the only way to heal him? That maybe, just maybe, it's the same way with heaven. It's the same way with our faith. That God is saying, there's only one way, but you can trust me. Let's get my wife turn the music up a little bit. I want you to think and pray through that. Everybody, Lord, who has heard this message, that, Lord, we've heard your credentials, that we know, Lord, we can trust you, that while the, it, the way may be narrow and it may be hard, it will be worth it. 
wide is that road that leads to destruction? Almost like a highway. And maybe a four or eight lane highway headed to destruction. And maybe it's a single U.S. highway heading to you. But we, your people, are called to be on that narrow road. To follow after you. Lord, I pray for all those who are listening and may have had doubts that through this message, through our series that we are going through, that their doubts would be answered and they would be encouraged and emboldened to trust you, to live out their faith without any doubt that you are who you say you are and what you say really is truth. That, Lord, there is an absolute truth. Much like gravity, gravity exists whether we believe it or not. So, so may it be with our faith in you. So, Lord, I pray for encouragement and strength. I pray for uh, feelings of uh, uh, comfort and peace to people right now who are sitting there feeling guilty for having doubts. Lord, just get rid of that feeling because we know condemnation is not from you, Lord Jesus. I pray that you give them peace because they know that you love them. Your word in John 3, 16 and 17 says that, you, that God, you, the, you so loved the world that you gave your only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. For you sent your son into this world not to condemn the world, but that through it we may be saved. You, Jesus, came after us. We don't have to try to please you, Jesus. We don't have to try to earn your favor, Lord God the Father, you gave your favor on us when you sent your Son. So Lord, I pray that whoever needs to hear that this morning knows that they are loved, they are wanted, they are accepted, and they are treasured by you, Heavenly Father. Yes, we're not perfect. Yes, we all have our differences. Yes, we have failings and fallings. But you never stop loving us. You gave your Son for us, knowing that we would fail you. Lord, may each of us have peace in our hearts and mind, knowing that we received you. And listen, if you're listening for this for the first time and you've never invited Jesus into your heart, listen, just all you have to do is simple. Say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I am a sinner. I fail many times. I can't do it. And you're probably feeling overburdened, overstressed, and worn out kind of like what Jesse talked about last week. But you don't have to be anymore. You can say, Lord Jesus, I want you to come and be Lord of my life. Help me to trust you. Help me to put all of my life in. I'm banking on your credibility, Lord Jesus. I'm trusting in you. And if you say that prayer, he's willing to come. He wants to come. And he will be with you. Not just for today, but forever. Lord, I pray for those who have prayed that prayer, that, Lord, they sense now a peace and a calm that you are with them. And Lord, I pray that we would all go with a firmer understanding of who you are and how we can trust you. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, I hope you enjoyed this first part of the series. Uh, maybe enjoy it's not the right word. I hope it made you think. Um, I tell, when I was teaching core cadets before Jesse arrived, I used to tell the core cadets all the time, and Jeremiah can verify this, that I don't want you to hear something I say and just accept it point blank. I want you to research it. I want you to test it on your own. I want you to know why we believe what we believe. I want you to know why you believe. And so not just for the core cadets, but for everybody in our church, everybody who is watching this, I want you to know why you believe what you believe. And so for the next uh, series of weeks, we're going to be doing this series, and I invite you to watch. And if you have friends that maybe aren't Christian, maybe invite them to watch with you. Maybe I'll be hitting some of the topics and objections that they have about Christianity or religion, and you just may never know that you're inviting them to watch might be what opens the door to faith for them. So I want to encourage you over the next few weeks to invite somebody to watch with you. Socially distance if you can. But if it's a family member and you know that none of you have the virus, invite someone to watch. Send them the link. Share it on Facebook and invite, tag them so they can watch it safely. And just enjoy listening and learning together.
All right, so we're going to sing uh, our last song, song number 73. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him glory. And the reason I chose this song is because it all comes down to Jesus. Can we trust him? What we've learned about today with the doubts and the, the disbeliefs is that everything in our faith comes down to the person of Jesus, who we know is God's son and reigns with him, sitting at his right-hand side. But here's the greatest thing. He's coming back one day for us. And so the whole world will eventually see that Jesus is who he says he is. And that's a day we can look forward to. So we're going to sing out, I believe, verses, uh, we'll sing on verses 1, verses 2, uh, and then verses 4. Uh, and then if there's a verse 5, we'll sing verse 5. We're going to skip verse 3. which is our scripture for the year. Uh, granted, at the time that we prayed and chose the scripture for the core, Laura and I had no idea what we were going to be going through. And when we brought it to the core council for approval, the core council had no idea what this year was going to look like. But as it turns out, God knew, and God truly did direct us to the very appropriate scripture verse, verses for the year. So please, as we share our benediction, uh, share with Lieutenant Laura as she brings it with us. I hope you all are getting very familiarized with these two scripture verses. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. It says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We pray that you have a wonderful week. And if you need anything at all, please reach out to us. Uh, you can, uh, if you need any um, uh, prayers for you, if you have prayer requests, um, we have. Um, you can message us through Facebook. But also you can
put a prayer request through our website and that slide will be up here for you to see. And we want you to know that you are in our prayers every single day. And what's even better is that God is with you right where you are. Be blessed this week, everyone. Faster, you